sometimes problems may arise also when there's a lot of um, biogeochemistry happening, so we have methane production or denitrification, and the gases fill up this chamber, and then that gets to the bag, it might block the flow, it causes problems for these. Um, so there are different designs that later on having a different flow shape and, and other shapes of these chambers to avoid this problem. I would also like to mention here while we are at this figure that pi is plotted with a dashed line and SGD rate, so the direct measurement of SGD is um, the solid line, and we see that <coughs> right as the tide so uh, starts falling is when we have the maximum SGD. So that's when the hydraulic gradient turns around between the aquifer and the ocean, right? So um, high tide pushes against the aquifer, so the hydraulic gradient is not as large as when tide starts dropping, so that's when we see maximum discharge. And that's um, usually, that's a very typical setup in coastal setting. That's what you find. A low tide, you would expect the highest actually, or no falling tide. Another um, uh, important finding from early studies was that uh, the early, very early models predicted that all of the SGD would discharge as a line or either with the coastline. It was recognized that while that's not exactly the case, it's, it's, the reality is pretty close. In that, in, in a near shore scale, where we would expect the largest SGD is right here. And, and so this figure shows um, logarithm of SGD against the logarithm of depth in the water column um, uh, by Makoto Taniguchi. This one uh, has plotted against distance. So they both show the same thing that indeed the closer to the tight line we are, the more SGD we can expect. That's why it mostly, uh, most of it discharges. This is also confirmed by another method that's used for direct measurement, and that's by the nested piezometers, where um, one can outfit them with temperature, um, solidity, or conductivity, and depth sensors, and just let it run over a couple of tidal cycles. And uh, from that, it's easy to compute the hydraulic um, heads um, within these piezometers which is plotted on here. So the red one is P1, that's the most um, landward, and the uh, pink is the most seaward piezometer, and <coughs> so the largest um, changes are experienced in the ocean side where the high tide, low tide difference is, is quite big. Uh, once you get a hydraulic uh, head um, and uh, we get hydraulic conductivity, then just simply applying the RC's law um, SGD can be, or, or groundwater flow can be calculated. And this very nicely shows this method that allows you to measure both discharge and recharge of water in and out of the aquifer. Unfortunately, this technique is not very much applicable in Hawaii. We don't have many sandy beaches. Um, uh, I mean, there are some that, that this could be done, but we don't have all that many sandy beaches that where you can pound this down deep enough to actually catch it. Um, some fresh water. Another direct method is uh, using eddy correlation techniques. Uh, the principle here is that right at, at about the sediment bed, um, current velocity, direction, and then a property such as ox oxygen content, temperature, or solidity is, is measured. And uh, there is turbulence from wave action and, and currents. There is some vigor vigorous turbulent mixing. We know what the mixing is. It's measured by uh, uh, this acoustic Doppler velocity meter. Um, that actually the, the measurement point is right here. That's outlined by this little cylinder. So the ADV measures the currents, the du their direction and magnitude, and um, this pro probe specifically these images from uh, the oxygen measurement, but this has been done for uh, solidity also and temperature. And then based on the measurements of velocity and oxygen concentration, a flux of oxygen or, or even fresh water if solidity or temperature is used can be estimated. So this was fairly by Peter Berg and then uh, adapted with John Crozier, by John Crozier to specific SGD measurements. Um, 
it seems like this would catch only a small scale, but if you inc uh, incorporate the, the currents into this, you are actually capturing a, a, a several meter large area. So these are just a few examples that I wanted to mention to the class about um, direct measurements. <coughs> uh, now let's look at some other um, methods um, that, that are used and, and uh, I thought for the class to mention. And obviously, we care about terrestrial fresh water discharge, so solid to be one of the tracers, one of the indicators that, that we would use. And while it, it's a chemical property of the water, we can actually use it also for geophysical methods, for uh, subsurface resistivity imaging. So in a surface, obviously, an, an SGD, if it's, it contains anything, brackish or fresh will alter the coastal salinity. And uh, this is an example of a survey on the coastline in Mauna Loa Bay, where um, we see spots of lighter blue, those indicate lower salinities. And uh, the problem with salinity is that if it is indeed SGD, then it's only the fresh fraction that, that you can detect. And uh, for a fresher brackish, and in many places, like here, Paiko Lagoon, it's a stream, it's not SGD. So you can't really distinguish the, uh, I mean, you can obviously um, look at your side and see if, if you have any streams or surface runoff, but it doesn't distinguish between surface and groundwater inputs. But we can look at solidity in the subsurface, and that's done by electric resistivity measurement. And this is an example of streaming resistivity profile <coughs> in a coral reef setting, where um, uh, the idea behind this is that if you if you assume a homogeneous substrate, uh, let's say porous sand, where the porosity doesn't change in space, um, if you fill that space, uh, those pore spaces with fresh water, it will be much higher resistivity than if you fill that same space or same pores with seawater, salty water. So the higher resistivity within the pores or, or with your measurement then indicates areas where the fresh water outcrops to the surface. And so um, one can put together this very nice 3D image even of, um, uh, can identify outcrop locations of fresh water. And so this can be done spatially, um, but also on, on, uh, on temporal, Skills. So looking at Kiholo Bay, this is in Kiholo Bay in Hawaii, uh, this cable right here lays on the ground, it has several um, electrodes on it <coughs> that can send electric signals, so the electric current into the ground. And that current will travel easier from one electrode to another if the soft surface is filled with saltier water. It will have much harder, harder resistive, resistivity um, to get to the other electrode if it's filled with fresh water or if it's filled with air. So <clears throat> what we see on these images is the same locations. The cable was not moved, but we looked at electric, electric resistivity at high tide of the subsurface and at low tide. And we see that there is a big difference. So um, while high resistivity could be created by presence of a rock, for example, in, in the subsurface, and you don't know if there are rocks, that's why it's good to do this dynamically, so compare low tide, high tide, you see that these red blobs significantly increase during low tide, that means that the pore spaces are filling up, and in this case actually these are identified as conduits, lava tubes, and so forth, uh, those are filled up with fresh water at low tide, that's when the hydrogen gradient increases and the fresh water from the aquifer. Another physical technique is, what you heard about already last week, is using temperature. It's because um, the, the groundwater that's recharged at higher elevation preserves its temperature signature. It's much colder than the oceans. It's the image that Craig also showed you last week, so that's his, um, his and his students' work. Um, so that shows groundwater discharge um, wherever we see colder temperatures than the ocean temperatures. So the ocean is the uh, red one. Um, the disadvantage of this technique is that um, it only gets the skin layer surface. You 
still have to go and ground through and see how thick that ground water through is as, as we heard last week. All right, so let's get more into geochemical signatures. Um, there are many different chemicals and chemical signatures that have been used to identify SGD and, and quantify SGD. For example, just basic isotopes of water. Because groundwater um, uh, isotopic hydrogen and oxygen isotopic signature is completely different from the seawater. Um, as shown on this spot right here, this is from Sicily. Um, groundwater, uh, because it's recharged at high elevation, colder temperatures, that um, results in more negative uh, isotope values is different from seawater, and then here we see somewhere in groundwater discharge that is a mixture of these two, so that looks very nicely along here. Um, this is used as an alternative for salinity. Uh, this image, this figure is from work by Godoy in Brazil. They have, at this side, they have huge concentrations of nitrate, 3,000 microvolts in the groundwater, yet the bay was pristine, so they were trying to investigate whether they have potential problem in that if that groundwater discharges to the bay, they will have significant eutrophication. So uh, they put seepage meters down in the bay, and they collected water into the bag, and they measured the isotopes in that. And they found that indeed, all, they got some water filling the bags, but they identified that it was exactly the same as seawater, so it was only recirculated seawater, and after that, they discovered that the bay was actually sealed with cement from, from previous some industrial operations there. So um, that helped preventing the groundwater from discharging. So these are isotopes of water, also methane and other products of biogeochemical, uh, metabolic uh, byproducts uh, have been applied to look for SGD signature. And um, methane, for example, is produced copiously in anoxic environments. Uh, its problem is, though, that it's not conservative, so it can undergo biogeochemical changes, division from the water to the atmosphere. Evolution is another process, so when methane is building up in the sediment, the bubble is growing, 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 eventually it's so buoyant that it just escapes the sediment without even the advection being present. So, <clears throat> same is true for these other gases. Nevertheless, there are examples that show very good correlation of HD locations with, with methane. Um, so that's um, uh, as an example here. We have salinity, really fresh water uh, because of ground uh, water discharge here and here, also accompanied by high methane. Same, uh, very nice long time series was produced by uh, Robert Kim on Jeju Island, where he uh, has salinities, also radon measurements, that's another tracer, and methane. They all corroborated the same story. So in these special cases, methane was a good, good tracer. And then Isaac Santos uses all these other uh, metabolites uh, um, to look at uh, uh, SGD signatures in coral reefs. All right, so we move on to natural radioisotopes. And there are actually um, almost limitless possibilities um, on selecting these, though not just the ones that I highlight, highlighted here. But the ones I'm going to talk about are the radium isotopes, and specifically radium-226, and then uh, radon-222. Those are, the advantage of these is that they are constantly regenerated in, from the rocks in the aquifer. So any groundwater will get enriched in them, and so that signature can then travel in the water and, and persist, and then because the the particles to, to water ratio in the ocean is very small. The ocean has very little of, of these isotopes. And um, the, the application of these isotopes has been um, uh, included in this very nice review by Matt Shred. The, the idea behind the application of these is that because the known point sources, so the SGD that's diffuse and, and, and happening over larger spatial scales, it's hard to quantify um, a flux by difference approach is used. So what that means is you can identify all these other terms and at the end what's left over is coming from SGD and so we can, we can quantify SGD. And uh, a terminal paper in the SGD history was the one by uh, Billy Moore who measured radium isotopes 
uh, along the sun, South Atlantic bike, and he found that um, the near shore activity in Reedy was quite high. Uh, it was not even um, when he did the math, the rivers that bring in radium also were not able to support all that inventory that he measured. Um, and that the groundwater indeed had very high radium concentrations. So he suggested that the excess radium along the shoreline there comes from, from groundwater. Uh, there, there is still this problem with, with using these tracers in that what do you use as groundwater and member? Because the geology can be so heterogeneous, um, a car still give a totally different isotopic signature than, than sand. And so how do you reconcile these differences? And some of these traces, such as radio itself, is um, solidity dependent. So in fresh water, it would like to stick to particles. And in saltier groundwater, it dissolves from those particles. So salty groundwater gets enriched in it. So radium is really good in, in tracking um, salty and brackish groundwater discharge. And so how you can reconcile this variation in the M member is that, for example, the advantage of radium is that there are different isotopes. You can look at different isotope ratios. And so that's specifically shown in these examples where distinct radium signatures um, come from different water masses and springs and um, <coughs> can even identify seawater recirculation by tidal pumping that happens on a much shorter scale, time scale. So there's not enough time for radium to go in as much equilibrium as is for the terrestrially long-term transport of, of groundwater. And so that's, um, those are examples uh, shown in this figure. Um, and then once, um, again, this is an example from Billy Moore's work. He plotted up all the marine or near shore samples and then the wells. And then obviously you can um, tease out what's the percentage from each of these uh, sources. Uh, and uh, this is the cookbook uh, recipe on how to actually do it with the math. So if using different isotopic signatures, identify fractions of fresh water, recirculated sea water, and, and ocean water. And I, I, I said I wouldn't talk much about uh, nitrogen fluxes, but, but um, I would make this extension uh, because this rep uh, represents very well the idea that if we, have, if we, for example, use radium and we get radium flux or HGD fluxes using radium, and if the nutrients um, here shown total dissolved nitrogen and total dissolved phosphorus are well correlated with that radium, then the radium flux obviously can be converted into um, nutrient fluxes. And um, so the South Atlantic bike was one example. This is another example that Craig already mentioned. These traces can be actually applied for all ocean scale. So this is the example that Craig mentioned for the Atlantic Ocean or based on all of the geosacs and other um, sampling events. Um, uh, oh, yeah. So, um, uh, following up that study, which was done in 2008, uh, a, um, a much newer paper in 2014 by Kwan et al., uh, they actually um, expanded this technique out to the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And the conclusion for both of these papers is that the total SGD, so not the terrestrial fresh, but the total SGD, uh, is um, now for the Atlantic was uh, 1.6, two times more than the river fluxes for, for the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Total SGD is three to four times larger than the river discharge. So indeed, it is applicable for large scale studies and it also shows that SGD is um, pretty important. Um, and then very quickly about radon which is also one of the earliest applied tracers. Also in 96, Jay Cable published this finding that um, they looked at the Gulf of Mexico where there was an um, isolated surface layer that was, didn't have much radon, but then the deeper water column had a radon excess 
that when they calculate it, if it could be supported by diffusion from the sediments, or simply diffusion, no attraction present, um, it could not. There was a much, much more excess rate on uh, that could be explained by diffusion, so it must be coming from SGD. And so they uh, indeed looked at the sediment depth profiles of, of radon and found um, an equation that fit their data and um, it showed not just diffusion as an important transport process, but also advection. And so this example I wanted to include because it shows the, the really small scale to the much larger scale that the radon you know, can be applied. And I'm not gonna go into these details, but I'm gonna go into my last three slides for running out of time, sorry. So, um, what, what I feel the new trends in SGD assessments are, are that we need long-term records, we need to know large-scale um, occurrence of SGD, we need it all in high resolution and of course, if possible, real time. <coughs> um, like we have uh, salinity now for all the ocean, which is great. Um, it's unfortunately not high enough resolution like the temperature satellites that uh, the temperature information from the satellites that could be used for, for SGD. But, um, so answer the large scale question is either using the, um, uh, using the airplane technique or uh, actually looking at satellite coverages uh, that have the advantage that the whole Earth is pretty much covered so you can look at any location um, and also that the imaging is cyclic so the satellites orbit and you get an image a couple of seven, seven days or, or something like that every seven days. So this is an example that shows colder groundwater discharge in Ireland. Or using drones like Craig is right now uh, spearheading in that um, advantage of this one is that you can just fly whenever as often as you want because once you have the instrument you can really get nice images and this is an example of cold plumes that Kawai Kui, so this is normal Bay, Kawai Kui, uh, cold plumes that are in the coastline. Uh, for the radon sensor, I think the U.S. latest and greatest would be this uh, submersible subrad, which is uh, a submersible that will be equipped by, for those of you that know the Rexan instrument, is plotted right here. So three of those put in, in a chain and have very high sensitivity and, and good resolution for even deep sea dives. For radon sensing, so we are not really stop on the embayment scale, but go into slopes and so forth. So this is headed by Rick Peterson from uh, um, South East Carolina, so you know, South Carolina University, and Chip Rayer from Woods Hall. And this other one is, is our addition to the technology. It's a coast, coastal moored system, it's called the Ashley Stiffer. It can produce long-term records. That's a completely autonomous um, instrument. And this is an example record from Kiholo Bay. So this is a one hour resolution radon. on. Uh, and obviously we expect this, cat, this, this much variation because of the tidal um, influence on, of the tides influencing on FGD. So the daily average changes significantly. So that means you know, FGD and other processes that affect the, the, the radon mass balance uh, change seasonally. So, uh, we will have another year of the impact and we will start to look at other um, important trends such as sea level and, and precipitation and recharge rates. And I leave it at that because I already ran over time but I'm just shut up to. Henrietta, on that last slide, it looks like you don't see anything at high tide. Correct, yes. The detection technique of this instrument is a little bit higher, oh, sorry, the detection limit is a little bit higher than the usual that 7 um, So we are losing some of the reviews at high tide. And is the subred made by Derek's company too? Or no, 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 but same, same, same. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Could you comment a little bit more on SGD in the deep ocean? I didn't quite understand what you were actually measuring. So, um, 
on the slope scale? Oh no, the center of the Pacific Ocean. You, you have made some plots that show ah, ocean ocean basin scale. Right. So what has been done is that um, a total inventory of radium two to eight has been measured by taking graph samples um, in the ocean. And once you account for what the rivers bring in, how much diffuses from the sediments, the shelf sediments, whatever is left over is then uh, from SGD. And actually he also accounted for atmospheric inputs. Um, Where does the sampling take place? So, uh, so Billy Moore's uh, work uh, here, every dot is a measurement. So the Atlantic is very well covered. So he was able to, oh, I don't have that figure in pictures, but uh, three by three degree grids, I think. Yeah. He had, so he estimated inventory of three by three degree grids. Then what depth in the ocean? Surface. Surface. Yeah. So presuming that um, most of the inputs happen into the surface, next layer. Yes, so this would not account for hydrothermal and other things that are isolated from the bottom. And then the Pacific one, the coverage is so much poorer. There are much fewer measurements. And so what they did is they actually involved the model, uh, um, an ocean circulation model, to how based on those few measurements. So these are the actual um, measurements. So you see the Atlantic is much more dense than So based on these few, they made a model of gradient distribution. And then again, accounted for all that came from rivers and so forth to get the total SGD. Maybe first figure, first figure that you showed the cross section, which has measurement of salinity and nutrients. Did they relate correlated with the geology of the site? So the material looks like a mycelium in the form or Yes, so Wakiak Bay has a ten meter thick sandy top layer that's mm -hmm. homogeneous. <laughs> so you can, so you can it. Yes, yes. That's why all the all the many examples that I use, the textbook examples and how it should behave come from there because it's so uniform. That's a really porous wetland environment over there too, yeah. It's it's so that part is all sandy. Oh, okay. So it's not in not the wetlands. No, the, uh, no, no. Because those have incredible amount of flow through them as well. Also, yes, yes. But then the complexity of the clay layers and whatnot. But the what here really doesn't have that. So the, the shallow clay layers of 10 meters, I think. It's a bit off topic, but one of your last slides you showed a map of the world's salinity. Mm -hmm. Is that remotely sensed? Yes. Or? So now it's 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 relatively new. A couple of years now that it's available. And is that is. Based on density of water or how, how? No, no, no. That's uh wavelength, so they measure certain wavelengths. Uh, uh, I'm not well. exactly sure, but it's they have a big antenna on the satellite and they collect um, any remote sensing experts here. So anyway, uh, you can look it up online. I don't exactly know how that satellite works, but the resolution apparently cannot be improved because the antenna that they would need would have to be huge. Mm -hmm. So right now it's a kilometer or so. Which technique is more accurate to quantify this GD? Depends what you want to know. The scale, how large of the scale, how close to the shore. For Usually it's a combination of techniques. It's what, what I would recommend, but what we also do. You do several things first to scout out the whole area where I have the maximum fluxes, where I have what's the variation, and, and you combine things. For example, for small scale. Well, I like to use radon. <laughs> I like to use radon because it gives you the spatial and temporal resolution of the near shore environment. And, and so you're not just doing the spot measurement, but it integrates the signature of a couple of pencil meters depending on the physical oceanography. But 
that's not enough because it captures total HDD, so we still don't know what's, how much fresh, so you definitely add the you know, fresh water part, so the salinity measurements to it. You need to know the end members. So you put in kilometers, and then you might as well measure the hydraulic head there, the gradient. So it's always a combination. There's no straight answer. Okay. All right. So those of you in the class, take a 15 minute break. We'll be back in. 702,